Well, good morning. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of Ephesians. Uh, this is going to be our last Sunday morning in the book of Ephesians. Uh, we've been in it since February or March? March. We started in March. So we've been in it since March. Um, so we are wrapping it up. Uh, and how we're going to wrap it up today is I'm going to give basically an overview of the book of Ephesians, and it's going to show how Paul leads us and how Paul calls us to stand in our identity in Christ. Uh, but as you are, as you are uh, flipping to Ephesians, you can start there in chapter 1. We're going to jump around, but we're going to start at the beginning. Uh, but as you're, as you're flipping there, I want to talk to you about a show that Nikki and I watch. Um, it's called Lego Masters. You can think what you want, but it's awesome. Um, so what, what what works on the show, or what, ha- what happens on the show, is teams of two um, compete against other teams of two in challenges, right? So uh, Will Arnett is the host. I'm, I'm not sure who the writer is, but they, they write the, the show, and they write these challenges to where uh, you need to build a giant building, um, or you need to build, I think last week's episode, they were building something that was floating in the air. Uh, but a couple weeks ago, there was this one challenge where... Uh, they had to build a building, and it was going to be put on this earthquake machine, and, uh, which I think, if we had one of those in the youth room, uh, that would be awesome. Um, but if it, this is an earthquake machine, so it was this box that sat kind of on, up, up on their stage there, and they would build this building, uh, and they would take it and attach it to the earthquake machine, and then they would turn that earthquake machine on, and there were levels, so levels 1 through 10, and the earthquake machine would shake. The building would, would move kind of like that. Um, and whoever could build the, the, the building with the best structure uh, and have an aesthetic to it, so have a good design, uh, would win for that week. And so they would set the building on it, um, and they'd turn it on. It had levels, so you start at level one, and it's, it's just moving a little bit. The building's uh, kind of shaking, but not a whole lot. Uh, well, several of the teams got up to ten, and by that, I mean, the earthquake machine is really, it's really moving a lot, and the building's like, flapping in the wind, basically, um, and so the, the, the point of the competition that week was who can build uh, a structure that's built for stability and for strength. And again, think what you want about the show, but you should go watch it. Uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. It's fascinating to see how they build uh, these structures, how they build these designs, how they make these uh, creations. But for that week, it was really about structure. And that's what Paul is kind of getting at when he talks about um, our identities, when he talks about who we are as families, when he talks about who we are as a church. He is building us so that when earthquakes come, not literal earthquakes, but when earthquakes come in the form of spiritual warfare, when earthquakes come in the form of tragedy, when earthquakes come in the form of a culture that's constantly changing around us, leading us away from Jesus, we will be strong, we will be stable, and we will be able to stand um, in our identity in Christ. Uh, so that's what we're going to work through today. Uh, as I said earlier, we, our point for today is stand in your identity in Christ. And Paul is going to build us up one piece at a time um, so that we as believers can stand strong in this identity that we have. But to do that, we're going to start uh, on an individual level. So if you have your Bibles and you're in Ephesians, we're starting at verse 1. I'm going to read verses 3 through 5. Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will. If we think of our fir- as the first block, as the first thing that you build with, um, a- as the individual level, we think that this is where we're starting, um, we can place ourselves, we can see ourselves placed in the great redemption plan of God. Jesus came to save individuals. Jesus came to save you and me. Jesus came and died on the cross to die for the sins of us. Yes, he died and, and, and he created a church. And yes, he died and has a plan for the family. But we have to start individually. We have to understand what our identity is as individuals, as individual Christians. So in verse 3 there, it says, Blessed be, God the Father, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. 
we see that uh, we have been given these spiritual blessings. We see that those who are in Christ, those who have made a profession of faith, those he has chosen uh, and adopted into his family, as we see in verse 4 and 5, they have been given spiritual blessings. They are shown you are in Christ. You have been saved. This is your new identity. Before you were, you were dead, you were lost, and now this is who you are today. So we're starting with that foundation. We also, as I mentioned earlier, we have to look at verse 4 and 5. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. Before God created the world in Genesis 1, he had the plan of redemption. If that doesn't blow your mind, I, I, it does mind. Maybe, maybe I'm not to the level of some of you, uh, but, but it does mind to know that God had this plan to buy back. God had this plan to save his people even before he created the world. Even before Adam and Eve were in the garden, before Adam and Eve took the fruit, God had the plan to save his people. God had the plan to redeem them. And in verse 5, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ. If you are in here and you have been saved, if you are in here and you are a believer, you are adopted into a new family. You can look around at the people in your, uh, in your row or at the people on the other section, and they are your brothers and sisters. We can look at people who are having church right now around the world. Um, I, I tell this to students and kids when we talk about this. Um, in South America, we're in the same time zone um, as, as some of the countries in South America. So I spent a, a, a summer in Paraguay um, when I was in college. They're on Eastern time zone. Um, so when we had church at 11 o'clock, um, you guys had church at 11 o'clock. Um, so right now, all over the world, well, if you're in the same, similar time zone, um, in other parts of the world, other believers are gathering together uh, to worship. And that is all part of this adoption into the family of Christ. As you keep reading through chapter 1, uh, you will see that we have redemption, we have grace in Christ, we are sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Paul takes that first chapter to show this is what God has done in your life. This is what God has done through His Son. This is what God has done for you. Uh, but let's continue reading. Let's move over to Ephesians chapter 2 and look at verses 1 through 5. As we continue to look at our, uh, our identity on the individual level for salvation. Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work, and the sons of disobedience among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In chapter 2, uh, we have this contrast. Paul is showing... You were dead, you were lost, you were following the prince of the power of the air, which is Satan. You were following the world, living in the passions of the flesh, carrying out the desires of the body, by nature children of wrath. But then comes the gospel in two words in verse 4. But God. Paul is showing that this is who you were. This is what, you, this is what your life looked like before Jesus. But God stepped in. God stepped in. He sent his son for you because of his mercy and his grace. He sent his son to die for us so that we can look at our lives and we can look back and go, this is how I was. This is who I was. This was my identity before Jesus. I was lost. I was dead. I was unable to do anything. But now because of what Jesus has done for me, the sacrifice that Jesus made, this is my new life. And you guys will see the, a, a picture of this at the end of the service when we do baptism. Uh, when we do a baptism, as I've explained to, or had the joy of explaining uh, to, to some kids this week at VBS, uh, baptism is an outward sign of an inward reality. So when we put somebody down in the water, we bring them back up. Uh, it shows that uh, they have died, their old self has died, and their new self has been resurrected with Christ. You guys are going to see the exact picture of Ephesians chapter 2. The old has died, 
the new is alive. So when we think about our identity and what this means for, for standing uh, firm in our identity, for standing in the face of uh, a changing culture, in the face of spiritual warfare, in the face of, of tragedy in our lives, we have to lean on who we are and what God has done for us. We have to lean on what Christ has done for us. If you keep reading through chapter 2, uh, you'll, you'll read through verse 13. Where he says, But now in, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. You'll read verse 19, where he says, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. And then you'll read verse 22. He says, In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. These three verses here show our position in Christ. When you accept Jesus as your uh, Jesus' offer of salvation, when you accept that gospel, you become one in Christ. It's, it's kind of an abstract thought. It's kind of a strange, how does that really work? Um, but he talks about how when you have accepted who Christ is, if you've accepted this message of salvation, those who are far off have been brought near. Those who were strangers, uh, and, and not literal aliens, uh, but, but aliens as in um, people who were not considered the, the people of God, you have been brought in. You have been adopted. You have been considered fellow citizens. You are members of the household of God, being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So those of us in here who are believers you are, you, you are being built together by the Spirit. You are being built together because of your position in Christ. And He is building us for this, uh, the, the, to live in this world. He is building us for a purpose to be lights in a world of darkness. Uh, when you accept Christ, when you make a profession of faith, you are automatically drafted uh, to fight against spiritual warfare. You're automatically drafted to stand in your faith. We're going to get to standing as a family. And we're going to get to standing as a church. Uh, and that's similar to, to being in the, the, the company or being in a company in the military. Um, but we must not neglect the individual level. Paul is writing to the churches in Ephesus, but he knows that these churches are comprised of, uh, of individuals. And each individual must know uh, their identity, in order to stand rooted in that identity in Christ. So many of you know my dad was in the Navy. Um, he recently retired, uh, but he was in the Navy for, uh, I think, 28 years. Um, we moved around a little bit when I was younger, um, but from 2003 on, we lived in Virginia. Um, there are a bunch of military bases in that southeast corner of Virginia, so he just kind of got transferred from one to the other. Uh, he had a couple of duty stations with Marines. And um, if you know anything about Marines, or if you were a Marine, um, you understand a little bit of the Marine culture. Now, Marines are not soldiers. Marines are not sailors. They're Marines. Um, that is their title for them. Uh, you can, if, if you go to Camp Lejeune in North Carolina, which is a, a fairly large uh, Marine base there, you can pick Marines out on the street. Um, they usually have similar haircuts. Um, they, they kind of act a certain way. Uh, if you're in here and you are very offended by my general description of Marines, I'm very sorry. But likely, if you're a Marine in here, you're probably not offended by it. Um, they, have a, they, they kind of have a personality about them. Um, and most, not, not most, I would say there is a, a fraction of Marines who are 18-year-old students who have come in, enlisted, um, gone to boot camp, and become Marines. So if you think of a couple of our 18-year-old students over here, you think of someone like Gavin, or you think someone like Noah, um, would graduate from high school and go right into the Marine Corps. Well, the first place you go when you go into the Marine Corps is uh, you go to boot camp. Um, and boot camp is not fun. But what they do at boot camp is they tear you down, and they build you right back up into who they want you to be. They build you into somebody who um, is loyal to your country, they build you into somebody who is loyal to um, your company, to the, to, the, to the Marines that you fight alongside. They build you into someone who um, understands the order of this military branch and how it works and who gives the orders and who follows the orders. The Marines develop an identity. 
The Marines develop a culture. And the Marines have been effectively fighting in wars since the American Revolution. Uh, they are our branch of military that are on the front lines, that are standing um, in the front fighting for our freedoms here in America. Why are they effective? Because they understand their identity as Marines. They understand who they are, and that drives them to, to behave, to fight, to stand the way that they do. So when we think about our walks, when we think about uh, our, our individual faith, our individual salvation, our individual identity in Christ, that should motivate us on how we stand. That should motivate us on how we face spiritual warfare. That should motivate us on how we face the changing culture all around us. He wants his, Paul wants his readers to know they are in Christ. He wants to build that foundation that if you are in here this morning, uh, if you are in uh, the reading of the letter of Ephesians back in the first century, he wants you to know you were lost, you were dead, but now you're alive. You are in Christ. You have been saved. You, are, you, you, are, you have been transformed. You are new. So if you're in here and you are a believer, then remember what Jesus has done for you and live according to your salvation. You've been drafted. It's time to stand. But if you're not a believer, you are still fighting for the wrong side. Um, I would urge you to repent, uh, to turn to Christ, um, to, to join uh, the, the, the fight against the darkness. However, in our American culture, we can take the individual side too far. Uh, we're very individualistic. Um, and what I mean by that is, is uh, we typically think what's best for the individual versus what's best for the group. And if you're sitting out there thinking, no, that's, that's not true. I'd never think like that. Um, I, we we want to stand out. We want to make a name for ourselves. Uh, we don't want to depend on anybody. We don't want to ask people for help. Um, if you've ever said, no one tells me what to do. Um, <laughs> Mason, yep. <laughs> uh, right, if, no one, if, if you've ever said, no one ever tells me what to do, that's individualistic. We want to, we want to be strong, special standing out individuals, um, and we can take this understanding of our individual identity too far. But Paul doesn't. In Paul's letter to the Ephesians, as we've gone through over the past several months, uh, we got to the section on the immediate family. So if you have your Bibles, continue to turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. And Paul talks not on an individual level, but on a family level. See, at the end of Ephesians 5, he, he, he uh, writes to the wives, he writes to the husbands on what a marriage should look like and what a, how a marriage is a picture of um, the, the gospel, how Christ loved the church. In the beginning of chapter 6, Paul talks to the children. He talks about how they are to honor their parents, how they are to respect their parents because it's a commandment that has carried over from the Old Testament. Uh, and then... Verse 4, there, there's one small verse in there to fathers where he talks about fathers not provoking your children to anger, but instead raising them um, in the way of the Lord. Paul wants us to, to, to fight, to stand in our families, not just as individuals. See, he puts the, uh, the, the spiritual warfare passage right at the end. Uh, and and it, it, it could be that the book is leading up to this uh, th this grand climax of spiritual warfare, uh, but it also can be this idea that Paul is writing a letter. Remember that he's writing a letter that's going to be circulated to churches, and as he, th he as he's writing through um, the, the the theology of how Christ has saved us, how God set this plan of redemption for us, as he's writing through how we should live, as he's writing to how. Uh, families should, should work together, how families should be the biblical model of, of Christ loving the church, Paul gets to this spiritual warfare uh, section, or gets to the end of his letter and goes, all of this is going to be really hard. And these, this is the power that you're going to face against. Uh, so you need to be strong in these different areas. So if, if we think about our individual level, we, we, we look at that. Let's continue to look at our, our family level uh, these applications here are difficult. If you were here when, when Rio preached uh, Ephesians 5 and, uh, and the beginning of Ephesians, Ephesians 6, uh, you probably sat there going, that's hard to do. I, I, I don't know if I really like that passage. 
I don't, that, that one really doesn't just get me jumping out of my seat with excitement. Because our sinful desires want to say, no one tells me what to do. Our sinful desires want to say, well, I don't, I don't have to do that. That's, that's outdated. The Bible doesn't know what it's talking about. The culture around us only feeds into it. The culture around us would say, wives, submit to your own husbands? No way. That's, that's, that's outdated. That's, that's archaic. That's ridiculous. The culture would say, husbands, you're going you're gonna to lay down your lives for uh, your wife? You're going to sacrifice your ambitions? You're going to sacrifice um, your time for your wife? Oh, man, it's all about you. Uh, you, you do you, um, and, and she can follow along. The culture would be okay with children obeying their parents uh, from a parent standpoint. But from a, from a student and a child standpoint, isn't it often cool to poke fun at your parents? Isn't it often cool to, to say, well, they told me to do this and I didn't do it? And fathers, the culture would say, uh, make sure that your kids are, are nice people. Make sure that your kids get good grades. Make sure that they uh, get a scholarship of some sort to a school. Uh, make sure that they're well-rounded citizens. But Paul says, in each of these areas in our family relationships, we have a job to do. Wives, the job is to submit to the husbands and his spiritual leadership. Husbands, the job for us is to lay down our lives for our kids. Not our kids, for our wife. Uh, Children, your job, children and students, your job is to honor your parents. And fathers, your job is to raise your kids in the way of the Lord. And these, we can, we can read these passages and go, ah, that just seems really hard. Yes, uh, it, is, it is very difficult. Uh, but if God designed it, and God did, then it's good. God does not design anything that is bad. God does not design it does not design anything that is wrong. God has made a plan for families uh, to, to gather uh, together, uh, to, to fight, to stand and fight together, to be a light in this world of darkness. When we think about our families, when we think about uh, the, the way that we, the way that our marriage looks to the outside world, when we think about the way our parenting looks to the outside world. We think about, students, how our relationship with our parents looks to the outside world. What are we communicating? Are we communicating a love for Jesus? Are we communicating a, a gospel transformation? Or are we communicating that we look just like everybody else? Do my, does my parenting look just like somebody who is not a believer? Does my marriage look like somebody who is not a believer? What do our marriages reflect? What are our priorities as parents? And is our relationship with our parents affected by the gospel? Because we are drawing these building blocks back to the issue of spiritual warfare, um, it's important to know that the devil wants us to be divided. He wants us to be divided in our marriages. He wants us to be distracted in our parenting. He wants us to be ultimately ineffective for the kingdom of God. See, if a biblical marriage is is meant to point people to the love that Christ has for the church, then Satan is going to seek to chip away at that love until what's left is just barely a tolerance for each other. It isn't really showing anyone how Christ has loved the church and what it's instead is showing, well, these people have said that they're believers, they know that um, they're they're not going to get divorced, but they're just hanging on. It's no love in this marriage. There's no love. There's no love of Christ in the church. And that marriage has, uh, has failed to reflect what Jesus and what God's plan for it was. We must fight for our marriages. When we think about spiritual warfare. We think about, oh, I need to, um, I, I need to go and I need to pray for long hours and I need to put... Uh, concentrated effort into fighting against the, 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 uh, the schemes of the devil. And yes, absolutely. But a way that we fight spiritual warfare in our families is fight for our marriages. 
husbands and wives fight to uh, fight to embody the biblical view of what marriage should look like. Fight to embody what God has said. This is the best way for a marriage to work. This is the way marriage is designed to work. Uh, That is how we fight spiritual warfare for those who are married. For those who are kids in here, for those who are students, fighting spiritual warfare, you can think, well, I'm not quite old enough. Um, I just show up on Sundays and Wednesdays. Um, But our, our fight for spiritual warfare begins in the home. It begins with how we treat our parents. It begins with allowing our parents to lead in a way that leads you to Jesus, that leads you to a love for the Scripture. And fathers, the way that we fight for uh, spiritual warfare or fight against spiritual warfare in our home is to train our kids. Uh, I've told this uh, statistic. I I don't have the the specific number, um, but the, the Muslim faith, the Muslim tradition, um, they have a lot of kids. Um, they're, I, I'm not sure why they have a lot of kids or what the factors are, but m- m- Muslim people typically have a lot of children. Muslim people are also really good at teaching their kids what they believe. And so as Muslim families continue to grow with kids who continue to grow up to be Muslim, the Muslim faith expands. And as Christians, we have the same opportunity. Christians can have kids just like Muslims can have kids. Um, Christians can train their children in the way of the Lord and direct them to the way, to the things of God, just as uh, Muslim parents do the same thing. So for those of you who are parents, for those of you who are grandparents, for those of you who are parents of kids who are no longer living at home, who may have moved out, who may have families of their own, you still have a responsibility to do. It doesn't say in Ephesians chapter 4, fathers, until they're 18, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Fathers in here, you have a responsibility to point your kids to Jesus for their entire life. That's our job. That's our job as fathers. Um, That's how we fight spiritual warfare. That's how we push back against the darkness. That's how we push back against this culture that says, fatherhood, it's just for making successful kids. Marriage, it's just the old ball and chain, right? Kids, you do whatever you want. Don't listen to your parents. God's design for the family is, is to be a light within the home that pushes back against darkness, that that stands on their identity in Jesus, that shows we are believers. In this house, we trust in the salvation of Jesus. And we're going to teach it. Um, So as husbands and wives, parents and grandparents, we have a role outside of these four walls. When we leave here, we still have a role. We still have our identity as believers. Uh, We still have a job to do. And if we live, can live out that identity by protecting our marriages, by parenting with a purpose, we can be strong in the Lord and in the strength of His might. And Paul has written concerning the individuals. Paul has written now concerning about uh, the family. Uh, but let's continue to look at this, this last broader understanding, last broader building block that Paul is going to put together, and that's the church. Paul's going to show how the church is being built up in Christ and how we are to stand together to face the attacks of the devil. So flip back to Ephesians chapter 4. Uh, we're going to look at verses 11 through 14. At the beginning of Ephesians 4, uh, Paul writes about the unity. Uh, well, first he starts with walk in a manner worthy of your calling. And then he talks about the unity of believers. Um, and I actually preached this passage um, several weeks ago. Um, so we did this then. We'll do it again too. Um, if you will look to your neighbors, look to your right, look to your left, look around at the people in here. You guys are all pretty different. Um, we, we have different likes. We have different dislikes. Um, we have different personalities. Um, we have different uh, preferences in the way church should go. But Paul says that we are all uh, There in verse 4 of chapter 4, there is one body and one spirit. You are called to the one hope that belongs to your call, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Paul talks about the unity of of believers. 
So when we look around in here and we see all of the differences, we are all united in one gospel message. We are all united under one kingship of Jesus. So Paul has built your individuals, uh, the, the individuals on their identity in Jesus. He has built the family to show this is what, uh, when he's writing to the family, he, this is what the family should look like. This is how it should go. Now he gets finally to the church. In verses 11 through 14, Paul writes, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son, Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. What Paul says is he's, he gives these gifts in verse 11. So he says, apostles, prophets, evangelists, shepherds, teachers. Um, and then in verse 12, he gives the purpose to equip one another for ministry in order to build up the body of Christ for the purpose of building each other up. But why? Verse 13, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Basically, maturity. As we meet each Sunday, as we meet each Wednesday, as we gather together in homes and in the community throughout the week, as we come together, we are stirring each other to maturity in Christ. So that, in verse 14, Paul says, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Paul's talking about standing. Paul's talking about building a body of believers who will stand. So when false teachers come and say, no, you need to believe this. This is the real gospel of Jesus. We as a church can say, no, that's not true. I know the real gospel of Jesus. It's in this book. So that when the world says, you do you, follow your heart, be whatever you want to be, we say, no, I know who I am. We as a church can stand and say, we know who we are. We know that we are chosen people of God. We know that we are, we are adopted into His family. But we grow together. We, we have these gifts to be able to stir each other together towards the Lord, to be able to stir each other towards the things of Jesus. Now, Paul, in other books uh, of, of his writings that he has in the New Testament here, talks about the church as being a body. Um, and how e- each body has, uh, has, has arms and legs and uh, body parts that function in specific ways uh, to where that's how the church should use its gifts. We each have different gifts. We function like a body that the different body parts function different ways. But think about a, how a body grows. Uh, we are watching, we're in the, watching Everly grow. Uh, she's going to be six months um, at the beginning of next month. Um, and she's already a lot bigger than she was when she was born. Um, and it's really fun to watch her grow. Um, it scares Nikki because she's like, please stop growing. <laughs> uh, but it's really fun to watch her grow and, and to, to see her personality come out and to see her be able to do different things, be able to grab things, which inevitably make it straight into her mouth, um, to be able to push her head up. Um, she, she's rolling pretty well. But if humans grew just like one part at a time, um, think how strange that would be if um, all of a sudden, like, we wake up and Everly has the same wingspan as me. Um, she's still a baby, but her arms are this long. Um, it would not make, it, it would be ridiculous. But think if we, we wake up one day and her leg, just one of them, is as long as mine, but her other leg is still here. The rest of her body is, is, is real small. Her leg is really long. She's got one fully grown adult leg and nothing else. Everly would not be able to stand. She would not be able to stand. I, I mean, she's got one strong leg. But if I had all of you stand up, all of you with your adult legs, she wouldn't, you wouldn't be able to stand for very long like this. Um, I'm already wobbling. Um, she would not be able to stand for very long. And any kind of opposition would just push her over. 
When we think about it, the church, when we think about us as a body of believers, we are to stir each other to grow. We are to stir each other to maturity. That's why if I can make a plug for connection groups, it's a great place to do it. If I can make a plug for youth on Wednesday nights, that's a great place to do it. If I can make a plug to be here on Sunday mornings to hear the word preached, that it's a place to grow. And if I can make a plug for you to encourage each other in, in, in each, of you's, each of your walks, then that's a great place to grow. Because we are a body of believers meant to stand together, not on one really strong leg. We just hold on to one person who's got really strong faith. But for all of us to grow into the maturity that Christ has called us to. In Ephesians 6, verses 10, 13, and 14, they have plural verbs. What that means is not, uh, we'll, we'll put it in, in, in southern terms. It's not you do this, it's y'all do this. Um, so he's, he basically says in, in, in verse 10, finally be strong in the Lord. That's a plural, so y'all be strong. Um, verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God. It's not you, you be strong, it's y'all be strong. And in 14, stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth. Again, it's not you stand, it's y'all stand. Paul is writing to the Ephesian church, saying, as a church, stand together, shoulder to shoulder, linking arms, helping each other grow, right? This is Paul's message. As we build individuals, as we build families, um, as we build the church, as we, sh- as we come together to see what Jesus has done for us, as we come together week after week uh, to worship, to hear the word, uh, to grow together, to encourage, to see people saved, we are pushing back the darkness. We are gathering together to fight the fight of spiritual warfare. And as we wrap up our study in the book of Ephesians, I want you to think through how we have responded over the past couple months. See, some have come forward to join the church uh, since the beginning of Ephesians. Some have come forward uh, to, to pray for, for personal issues going on in their lives. Some have come forward for salvation. Some have brought their families forward and prayed together with them. But what have we done outside of the church? When we leave these four walls, I'm not, I'm not implying that none of you have done anything outside of the church, but I want you to think. When we leave these four walls, uh, we, we, we can come up and we can pray and, and we can make commitments in these four walls, but what does our life look like? By all means, if you're coming this morning to, to pray, do so. If you're going to come this morning to join the church, please do so. If you're making a profession of faith, we'll never turn any of you guys away. But what about on Monday? We can, we can nod and say, yes, we want to stand in our identity. We want to fight together as a church. We want to fight together as a family. But what about on Monday? What about on Tuesday? What about on Wednesday? Well, we're three days away from the, uh, we're, we're three days removed from the service, the, the sermon. Um, if it hasn't already been forgotten by then, it is now. Um, and, and we've moved on. How do we stand and fight then? What commitment are you going to make to say, This week, I'm going to push back the darkness. This week, on these days, fathers, I'm going to stand with my family. I'm going to pray for them. I'm going to to point them to Jesus. This week, I'm going to do X, Y, or Z to fight for my marriage. Guys, do we know our identities in Christ? Are we living in them? Are we standing strong in the face of spiritual warfare? Or have we shrunk back in comfort? We shrunk back in ease. I show up on Sundays. I show up on Wednesdays. Uh, Church is exciting. Life's good. Or are we gathering together? Are we standing in our identity? Are we fighting against the powers of darkness? Standing in the victory that Christ has already won. If you were a believer this morning, I would say take time to pray and to ask God what role He has for you. Pray that He would remind you daily of your identity in Him. Pray that you would surrender every aspect of your life to Him. And Guys, if you're in here and you're not a believer, I would urge you to repent of your sins this morning. Ask the Lord for forgiveness Turn from the life that you were living. Recognize that you are dead in your sins. 
and trust in Him. Give your life to Him. The altar will be open this morning. Let's pray. God, I thank you for uh, the, the, the opportunity to gather. I thank you for the opportunity to, to hear your word, to study your word, um, and to do it. God, I pray that you will be with uh, me, that you will be with the rest of us in this room, uh, that we would be able to stand in our identity, that we would be reminded of who Jesus is. God, that you would remind us that you would continuously uh, can continue to point us to who Jesus is and what he has done for us. God, I pray that we would stand firm, that individually, that as families, that as a church, we would be the light that pushes back the darkness. God, we thank you for this church. We thank you for, for all that you are doing and how you are continuing to move. We thank you most of all for sending your son to die for us. In Jesus' name, amen.